Thank you, Brother Gaston. Take your Bibles. Turn to the book of Revelation, chapter number 18. Revelation, chapter number 18. The title of the message this morning is, Let There Be Praise. Let There Be Praise. When you find that place, just hold on to it for a few moments. It'll be a few before I actually get to reading it. We're actually going to join a little bit of a praise fest this morning. The Bible says in the book of Psalm 114, verse, no, excuse me, 147, verse number 1, that the singing of the praises to God is good. And throughout the Bible, praise is offered to God. We've been preaching through the book of Revelation. And there's been several praise sections in this book already. One began in chapter 4, verse number 8. A second one began in chapter 5, verse number 8. A third one began in chapter 7, verse number 9. And yet a fourth one began in chapter 11, verse number 15. In this section, we're gleaning through some of the last events, I believe, to take place in the tribulation. And there are three instances of praise offered to God in those last events. That's what we want to look through this morning. Some people say, I don't think I want to go to heaven because all they do is praise the Lord. Uh, first thought is, if that's your thought, don't worry about it. You're probably not going. <laughs> Second thought is I don't think that's all we're going to do when we get to heaven. I believe God created us with a creative mind. I think he gave most of us a working spirit. I believe God will not take that away from us. I don't believe it's sinful. I don't think it's part of the curse. I think that's the way God made us. So I think we'll do more things than just praise God when we get to heaven. Third thought that I have when I think along those lines is that nobody in a carnal state would want to do anything just one thing forever and ever and we get bored with it so we know God's going to recreate us and do away with some of our carnalness and make us into spiritual beings so that when we get to heaven I don't think it'll be what we have to do I think it'll be what we enjoy doing praising our God Let's back up for those that are just joining with us. Like I said, we've been preaching through the entire book. We find ourselves literally at chapter number 19 is where we're going to spend most of our time, but you're at chapter 18. Let's remind ourselves of what's taking place. Back in chapter number 16, uh, there were seven angels that left out of the heavenly temple wearing golden girdles, and they gathered up seven vials full of of the wrath of God. And the Bible tells us it was his last bowls, his last judgments that he's pouring out upon the earth. In that chapter, we're not told exactly when those judgments are poured on the earth, nor are we told how rapidly they are poured on the earth. But we did hear a voice. John recorded it in the book of Revelation chapter 16, verse number 17. He said the voice came out of that heavenly temple and it came out from the throne of God, and it said, it is done. Which would imply that by the time all seven of those vials are poured out, we are either at the end of the tribulation or we're nearly at the end of the tribulation. In chapter 17 and 18, they go together. They are the fulfillment of the message that the angel uttered back in Revelation 14, verse number 8. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. In that particular chapter, we see all three arms of the Babylonian system, of the Antichrist system mentioned. Back in Revelation 17, verse number 1, the religious arm is mentioned. It's called the great whore. In Revelation 17, 12, the political arm of the Antichrist system is mentioned. It's called the ten horns. And throughout chapter 18, the economical system is mentioned five times. Uh, that system is just called the great city. But all three of these systems are being destroyed, eaten away by God himself, so that by the time we get to the end of the tribulation, or nearly at the end of the tribulation, these judgments will be virtually completed. And yet in the midst of all of that destruction, in the midst of all of that ruin, the Bible describes there's reason to praise our God. Well, let's notice three reasons why praise is offered to God in these sections. Well, let's read the text verse. Look at chapter 18, verse number 20. It says, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, 
and you holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. The first reason why there's praise in the midst of all this judgment is they are praising God for what he has done. Praise is being offered to God for what he has done. Now, this particular verse is actually in that chapter of the judgment of political Babylon, excuse me, economical Babylon. It's at nearly the end of the chapter, which would mean that God has already completed most of his judgment on this entity called Babylon. In the midst of that, the people are being commanded, rejoice, praise God, why? For what he has done. Notice the command in verse number 20 is actually directed to the holy apostles and to the prophets. And it also mentions to heaven itself. I get the idea that all of this praise that's being offered to God during this time is coming from the heavens. Not much praise coming from the earth. And the reason why is because earth itself has very little left worth praising God for. In my mind, as all of this judgment has been poured out upon this planet, uh, literally the entire world is nothing much left except for a shredded, smoldering heap of ruins. Maybe there's a few places, a few pockets that God has not utterly destroyed, mainly because they are the hiding places of the saints. But by and large, the whole world lies in ruins and the Bible tells us they're not rejoicing, they're weeping. As a matter of fact, in chapter 18, verse number 8, we're told that they are mourning. In chapter 18, verse number 15, we're told that they are weeping and wailing. And again in chapter 18, verse number 19, we're told again that the world is weeping and wailing. The earth has no cause to rejoice as God pours out vow after vow and judgment after judgment. But in heaven, in heaven, there's cause for rejoicing. Amen. Bible says that he directs this towards the holy apostles and the prophets. However, I suspect there's a lot more folks than just the holy apostles and the prophets that are getting in on this praise fest. Why are they praising God? They are praising God for what he has done, for the judgments he has poured out upon this world. I get the idea that everybody in heaven that was ever afflicted by this old sinful world, everybody in heaven that had been hounded or hunted by this antichrist system, everybody in heaven who had known what it was just to dwell on a sinful planet, I get the idea they're all joining in with this command to rejoice and to praise God for what he had done to this awful and sinful earth. You need to note there's a change that's been taking place in heaven. Back in the earlier part of this book, the fifth seal, we were told that the saints weren't really rejoicing over what God had done at that point. In chapter 6, verse number 9, concerning those that had been offered, it says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell upon the earth. They weren't rejoicing. They were desirous that wrath would be poured out. Judgment would be poured out. Vengeance would be poured out. Things have changed since chapter number six. Now God himself is commanding those who had suffered to rejoice. Why? Because the judgment that he had promised has now been fulfilled. The Bible actually describes it. Look if you would at chapter 18, verse number 21. The violence of it. It says, and a mighty angel took a stone like a great millstone and cast it in the sea, saying, Thus will violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more. Now let's see if we can put together an image of exactly what has happened in the last few weeks, months, years 
of this time period called the Great Tribulation. In these last hours, God has poured vile after vile upon this planet. Literally, not a square inch, unless God in his mercy marked it for exemption, not a square inch of this planet has been unscathed from a sun shining so bright that literally it would scorch the backs of men just walking about in the out open fields. Not a pond of fresh water, not a sea or an ocean has not been cursed not been polluted, not been turned to blood, so that literally all across this planet, not one ounce of water exists unless God supernaturally exempted it from his wrath and from his punishment. Here literally in the last few hours, as we've been reading through these two chapters, chapters 17 and 18, God has poured his wrath upon the religious system of the Antichrist called the great whore. And the Bible makes it clear the whole world had gone worshiping after the great whore so that this destruction now would have devastated literally every heart and every religious home upon this entire planet. Bible mentions in chapter number 18 that every economical advantage that this world had somehow clung to. And it's difficult for me to imagine that they were able to cling to any with all the judgments that God has been pouring out these seven years. But every financial advantage that they had somehow clung to now had been destroyed. Actually, verse number 21 is specifically talking about how brutal the destruction of it was, as if a millstone was cast about somebody's neck and they were cast into the sea itself. A violent, a painful, a cruel, a horrifying judgment that God has bestowed. The only part of the Antichrist system that may still be in some tack would be his political system. It started out as ten horns or ten kings. And the Bible indicates those horns are attached to the beast so that they don't break loose from the beast. They apparently are loyal to the Antichrist down to the very last breath that they have. And yet I'm sure that by now that number has diminished. Book of Daniel describes that it doesn't stay 10 for very long, but soon shrinks down to seven, back up to eight. And now with all the judgments that God has poured out upon it, there's literally no telling how many of those politicians how many of those rulers are left? But if there's anything left at all, it would be their armies. And I suspect that their armies are what was described in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. We spent some time reading about that particular battle, how they will be slain and destroyed on the mountains of Israel. We think at the valley of Megiddo, so that the few that are left are now inching their way towards the city of Jerusalem for the final showdown in the midst of all that is destroyed of the Antichrist, of all that is destroyed of the world itself, God issues this utterance. Rejoice, heaven. Rejoice, you holy apostles. Rejoice, you prophets. Why? Because the vengeance that God has promised to you has been fulfilled. Might I just say, I might not be classified in heaven as the holy apostles. I might not be classified in heaven as the prophet. But when I see that happen, I'm liable to let out a little whoop too. Because that will be the day of all days. That will literally, literally be the day of the fulfillment of a prophecy that was written in the scriptures back in the book of Isaiah chapter 14. A prophecy of the devil himself. Listen, uh, Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Verse 5. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that shall see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man? that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms. My friend, by the time God finishes with the Antichrist, with the Antichrist system, with the devil, with the great prophet, with the beast, this prophecy will have been completely fulfilled. And God says, let there be praise. Why? For what God 
has done. But there's more praise to be offered. Look over at chapter number 19. Chapter number 19, beginning at verse number 1. Praise is to be offered for who God is. For who God is. Verse 1 says, and after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they say, Alleluia. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. Notice beginning in verse number two, the praise begins to drift back towards what God had done. Because he had judged the great whore, his just judgments are true and righteous, speaking specifically of his judgment upon the religious system. But back up in verse number one, he's not talking about praising God for what he's done. He's talking about praising God for who he is. Notice the word that's repeated some three times in this text, Alleluia. Alleluia. We don't use that term much in our good Baptist churches unless it's Easter and we're singing Easter cantatas. But we really should. The last syllable of that word, ya, alleluia, the last syllable is actually the first syllable of God's name, Yahweh in the Hebrew language. It's actually the combining of two words. Alleluia means in the Hebrew praise. Yah directs the praise to God. Literally, the word alleluia means praise Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. We might just say it, praise God. What are they doing when they use this word? They're praising God. What are they praising God for? A lot is related to what he has done. There's much good that has been done, but notice they're praising him for who he is. They use four words there. They use the word salvation and glory and honor and power. Uh, listed first on the list of why we should praise the Lord for who he is is we should praise the Lord, why? For his salvation. He is the God of salvation. I wonder why that's first on the list. You know, I ask these questions why all the time. The Bible doesn't give us the answer, so all we can do is guess, but I come up with two theories. Maybe, maybe number one, because it's a conflict of interest. Maybe because it's a conflict of our interest. You see, the choir that's singing this praise is the choir that needed salvation more than they needed anything else. You see, it takes salvation to get an old dirty rotten sinner into the gates of God's eternal heaven. And I got a notion that this choir made up of former sinners, of former derelicts, of former wicked people are gonna praise God and the thing that will come off of their lips first and foremost will be what they needed most to get them there. Praise God for his salvation. And they're praising God because he is the God of salvation. But then I got to thinking, maybe that it's not just a conflict of interest on the part of the choir. Maybe the reason they're naming salvation first is perhaps because that's the greatest work that God ever did. The greatest work that God ever did. Now, God's done some great works. I mean, let's think about creation. God's standing on the balcony of nothingness and nothing with nothing more than his word and his will. He speaks all things into existence galaxies of universes, glories that the human eye will never ever behold if God were to live us here for billions and billions of years with nothing but his word and his will. He spoke all of that into existence. My, what great power would be required to do such a thing as that? What great power would be required to know all that God knows? I mean, he knows everything that took place at every when and that took place everywhere. Now, I know I just created a new word. Everything, everywhere, but he also knows every when. He knows 
everything that has taken place. He knows everything that is taking place. And he knows everything that will take place. At every when, at every place, at everywhere, there's nothing that God doesn't know. What great power is required to know such things as this omnipotent and omniscient God knows. But then again, he's also the God who has power to rule over everything and every place. We're talking again about the galaxies of universes. We're talking about stars and planets and suns that you and I could not even begin to count, could not even begin to comprehend. And yet this God controls from the greatest to the least. He controls every creature, including every human being, including every atom, including every proton and neutron and molecule. He controls it all. He is Lord and God over all things. My, my. What power is required for a God to be able to do such a thing as that? But perhaps salvation is first on the list because the greatest of all the works he's ever done was to take the unholy and make it holy. To take the sinful and make it sinless. To take the vile and to make it clean. He did this by offering the carnal, the flawed, the fallen, the devil-loving, the rebellious life, liberty, and the love of God. And he backed it up with the power to change those who would accept that offer from inside to outside, from stem to stern, from guttermost to the uttermost, and to transform them in the very image of Jesus Christ himself. Might I tell you, I'm not sure that there's a greater work God could ever do than to save lost sinners. And I wonder, the reason the choir sings praise to God first because he's the God of salvation is because that's the most difficult work that God has ever done. I want you to know, it took something for God to save us. It took something. It took power. It took determination. It took love. And there's a prayer fest, praise fest going on in heaven right there. God's being praised, not just for what he's done, but for who he is. He's the God of salvation. Second word on the list is glory. Best definition I've ever heard of glory. Glory is the outward manifestation of the inward goodness of God. Glory is the outward manifestation of the inward goodness of God. Now, if that is the definition, and I don't know that it is, but I like it. If that is the definition of glory, that means all glory belongs to God because he's the only one that has that kind of goodness. And if you ever see anything and you think to yourself, my, that's glorious. Or you ever read something in the Bible and you say, that's glorious. The scripture calls it glorious. That means that glory is lent to that thing by God. Glory, when it appears on something, is the residue of the touch of God. I'm told that human beings, if we ever touch anything, we leave a fingerprint. Some things are too porous for us to be able to read the fingerprint that we leave. Maybe too liquid for us to read the fingerprint that we leave. But if we had the equipment, if we had the technology, literally everything we touch, we leave a residue, DNA and a fingerprint. Bible would indicate that God's glory, when applied to the earth or to other things that he's created, is the fingerprint God left on us after he touched us. Why are they praising God in heaven for his glory? Because they've been touched. They've been touched by the hand of God. And they're praising God for who he is. He's the God of glory. The third thing on the list that they're praising God for is his honor. Honor in that context means exaltation. It means praise. Adoration. 
The thought there is, we're praising God because He's the only one worthy to be lifted up and exalted. He's the only one worthy to be praised. He's the only one to be adored. He is the honorable God. He is the one and the only honorable God. And the fourth one is His power. His power is being praised. He's the God of power. Why would they be praising God in His power right now? Well, just remember what's taking place. God has just defeated everything that is against him. God has taken the Antichrist and all of his systems, along with religion and politics and economy, along with demons and devils and perversions of all kinds, and with nothing but the broom of his will, he has swept it into the trash heap of hell itself. If there's anything left, maybe the few armies that are left of this antichrist system. They're inching their way towards the city of Jerusalem where Jesus Christ himself later in this chapter will mount the silver steed and will ride to that place and will finish his cleaning by the word of his mouth as it leaves and destroys those evil armies. By that time also the antichrist, the beast and his false prophet will be cast into hell forever and ever. And even Satan himself will be cast in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Could I just tell you, there is no power like the power of our God. They're praising God for who he is. Let the praise begin. Why? Because of what he's done. Let the praise begin. Why? Because of who he is. And number three, let the praise begin for what he's about to do. For what he's about to do. To you and I, all of these things are future. To these that are living during that time period, some of them have actually already happened. But there's something about to be revealed to us that is happening. Pick back up at verse number five, Revelation 19, five. And a voice came out of the throne saying, praise our God. All ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Let the praise begin for what he has done. Let the praise begin for who he is. But let the praise begin for what he's about to do. The event being described in this particular text, the majority of it is the marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb. You study through the New Testament, you've probably walked away with this thought that when in the Bible, the Bible refers to the bride of Christ, we think he's talking about the church itself. And throughout the New Testament, if you've got a bride and you've got a groom, then at some point there's got to be a marriage. This text really does not discuss very much about the marriage, but it does give us some information. Mostly what it's talking about is the marriage supper of the Lamb. If you're going to have a marriage and a marriage supper, you've got to have some elements. Number one, you've got to have a groom. You've got to have a groom. You can't have a marriage and a marriage supper without a groom. In verse number seven, the groom is named, not by name, but by description. He's called the lamb, the lamb. We've seen that term all through the book of Revelation, going all the way back to chapter number four. Not only have we seen it in the book of Revelation, but we've seen it all through the gospel of John as well. The lamb is none other than the savior, Jesus Christ. The groom is none other than the savior, Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon made a point in one of his messages that I think is a good point. It's rather odd that at this point in the book of Revelation, God would still be referring to Jesus Christ as the lamb. The lamb relates to the sacrifice. 
He has many other titles. He has many other names. He could have chosen any one. Perhaps much more fitting would be the lion of the tribe of Judah. Let's face it. He's not been judging like a lamb. He's been judging like a lion. He has destroyed the world. He has destroyed the Antichrist and his system. He is about to cast the devil into the bottomless pit. This indeed is not the attitude, the behavior of a lamb. This is the behavior of a lion. Why did he not reference Jesus Christ as the lion of the tribe of Judah? He could have. Then again, there's many other names and titles that he could have used. He could have used literal names. He could have referred to himself as who he is. He is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. He could have called himself the Savior, the Redeemer. So many names, so many titles. And yet here in the midst of a book of judgment, as the judgment is being meted out, he refers to himself by one of the most meek titles available to him. He still refers to himself as the Lamb. Why? Why would God refer to Jesus? Why would Jesus refer to himself in this setting as the lamb? The Bible doesn't tell us, but I can only see one possible answer. It's because that's the title he would prefer to be called by. Of all the gifts that our Savior has given us, of all the gifts our Savior will give us, of all the eons we will have to enjoy his presence and his gifts, it would appear as though God never wants us to forget what he did for us on the cross. He could have referred to himself in a thousand different ways, but he chose the one that speaks of the sacrifice he made for us. Tonight we'll be partaking of the Lord's Supper. As oft as you do this, Amen. do it in remembrance of me. If we're going to have a marriage supper, we've got to have a groom. If we're going to have a marriage supper, we've got to have a bride. Again, if you read through the New Testament, you will probably walk away with the conclusion that most of us have walked, not everybody, but most of us have walked away with the conclusion that the bride in the New Testament is the church. It's us, the body of Jesus Christ. He doesn't spend much time in this text talking about the bride. Not really. He just mentions in verse number 8, her and her apparel. She's robed in the righteousness of the saints. In our culture, as well as in the Jewish culture, it was the bride who got to determine, the bride and the bride's family, who got to determine how the wedding would flow. M more times than not, in the Old Testament especially, and most of the time in the New Testament in our time, groom really has no idea what's going on. He just shows up for the service. Uh, maybe he's away, as in the parable in the book of Matthew. He's away preparing the house, and then he comes, and the bride and the bride's family has prepared the wedding and the feast, and he just enters in and enjoys it. However, in this particular text, I don't think it's the bride who gets to prepare the dress. I know it says the righteousness of the saints, but you and I know we have no righteousness. If we were to stand before God in our own righteousness, I'm afraid we would be indecently dressed. Where did we get that beautiful gown? It had to be he loaned us of his own righteousness. I wonder if perhaps the hand of God himself does not weave the gown that we'll wear when we join with him at this joining, this marriage, and this marriage feast. If there's going to be a marriage supper, there's got to be a groom. If there's going to be a marriage supper, there's got to be a bride. If there's going to be a marriage supper, got to be a marriage. It's alluded to in the text, but it's not described in the text. As a matter of fact, as much as we would like to preach messages on the marriage supper, the marriage and the marriage supper of the Lamb, it's hard to do so because actually there's so little information given about it at all. Literally, literally, literally nowhere in all the Bible is more mentioned of the marriage itself than what's mentioned right here in these few verses. And the only thing that's said of them is it was the marriage of the Lamb and the marriage supper of the Lamb no details are given of this marriage at all. Yet you can't have a marriage supper until first you've had a marriage. Wonder why. Why not spend some time telling us 
about the joining of the church to the Christ? Don't know. He doesn't tell us. In our culture, we have, we have a superstition. The groom should not see the bride on the wedding day, and especially in the wedding gown, until the doors are open and she stands there fully arrayed in all of her beauty and splendor and begins to walk down the aisle. I wonder if God's got a custom in heaven. I wonder if God has revealed literally nothing to us about the marriage itself, literally nothing about the marriage because he does not want us to speculate. It's just too special to speculate and to the body, the bride, is fully gathered and fully dressed in those robes of righteousness. And then when we're all together, this most special event that God has looked forward to since before the foundation of the earth will be revealed in the hall of its glory. If you were a groom that got to see your bride on her wedding day fully adorned and that was the first time you saw her, no doubt your heart leapt. And I am sure when we fully gathered, fully clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, stand before him to be joined with him forever. Our hearts will leap with excitement because we're part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let the praise begin. Why? Because what he has done. Let the praise begin. Why? Because who he is. Let the praise begin. Why? Because of what he's about to do. Let the praise begin. Why? Because you can be a part of it all. You and I, we can be a part of this. It's going to come to pass. As surely as all the other prophecies of the Bible are being fulfilled, some literally around us as we speak every promise of God, it will come to pass. You have an opportunity to be part of the bride. You have an opportunity to be robed in righteous garments. You have the opportunity to see from a heavenly view the wrath that God pours out upon this planet. Why would you not want to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior? I answer the question why quite often, though I know I can't, not qualified. But I have no answer for your why. Why would you reject Jesus Christ? I have no answer. And I don't think you do either. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, would you let this be the day when you do so? If you call yourself a Christian but you're not living as Christ would have you to live, would you let this be the day when you change the way that you're living and give yourself wholly to God? I pray you would let the praise begin this morning. Would you pray with me, Father? I thank you for the opportunity to preach. I thank you for the many reasons from the scripture we have for praising you. And God, we've not even gleaned over the reasons yet. There are so many. But Lord, we want to get on the bandwagon early. We don't want to just praise you at the end of the tribulation. We want to praise you today. And I pray that if there's any soul here that doesn't know you in the parking lot in the church, maybe watching on Facebook, they don't know you. I pray, God, that they would trust you this morning. Save sinners, change lives, and we'll give you the praise. For we ask it in Jesus' name.